It's a Bumblecast Mini, sponsored by Chaos Sonic 1. With the reveal at the time of writing that a certain studio doesn't want to hire fans and considers fans a red flag, and compare it to Sega and IDW hiring fans of Sonic and your hiring, do you agree or disagree? To me, while I can understand while getting a new perspective from those that are not fanning the thing, this fandoms actually keep the series alive and well, and hating the fandom actually makes people leave, if you ask me. I don't know the studio being referenced. I have no clue. I do not know it either. But uh, speaking to the concept in general, I feel like I see both sides of the coin because you want someone who is able to approach whatever this project is professionally. And if they are too deep in the weeds, they may get hung up on the details and the nitty gritty stuff that's just not going to matter to the larger project or to the general audience that's going to consume this. Yeah. On the other side, you can really tell when a project is handled by people who have no idea what they're doing with the IP. It feels off. Characters are just out of character. It doesn't feel like the thing that you want. It just doesn't feel right. And it raises a lot of questions, especially when it's you know supposed to be part of the greater brand, if it's not just a spinoff. Mm-hmm. So I feel like you need to find that balance of having someone who is knowledgeable of the material, but is also able to treat it in a professional capacity. Someone who has, you know, if not love for the material, then an understanding of it, an appreciation of it. Right without being so hung up on it that they can't bear to touch it in any way. That was one of the first major hurdles I had to get over when I got my first professional gig working with Archie was I grew up on these books. These were my sacred texts. And now I am playing in that toy box. Am I allowed to do things? And the answer is yes. There isn't a dedicated, this is how things should and always have to be. There are guidelines, yes, but there isn't like this 20-year plan set for anything. It was, it's a creative endeavor, create. So it's, and when it comes to hiring for such a thing, that's why you do interviews. That's why you look at portfolios and work history. If you you know, blacklist somebody just because they're in the fandom, you are immediately depleting your talent pool. It's a very short-sighted and frankly immature way of looking at handling a project. The sacred hedgehog texts. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I was waiting for that one. (laughs) Because you called them sacred texts. Uh, it's funny to imagine them as sacred texts, you know, these days. <laughs> Things have changed quite a lot. The reason why some people were frustrated about your Gore Magala representation is the cause of a couple of things. One, Gore Magalas are blind, and in order to compensate for it, it has something that makes it basically a walking extinction. Basically, the frenzy virus is everywhere on its body, which causes massively heightened aggression, speed, and strength in monsters making them dangerously short-tempered and ferocious. The frenzy virus also seems to affect a monster's vocal cords, rendering all vocalizations shrill and harsh in sound. And on humans, well, he or she will experience a nullification of their natural healing abilities, making it impossible to recover health without the aid of healing items. They additionally receive more damage from a frenzied monster's attacks. Imagine X dealing with frenzied sticks on that. Um, Also, if you're confused, we're talking about uh, how in Worlds Unite with Monster Hunter crossover. So I I think that's what this is going back to. When you get someone who isn't familiar with the license, you get incongruities just like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, This is why you hire fans. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Gormagala was specifically requested by Capcom. and. In my research, I didn't come across this, which clearly shows I did not research enough. But uh, if you really want an in-universe explanation, say that Styx managed to calm Gore Magala to the point where it was able to 
keep the frenzy, frenzy virus in check. And she uniquely was able to guide it into battle. Sure, we'll go with that. Mm. <laughs> I mean, Styx can barely keep herself calm, much less calm anyone else. I don't know how that would work out, but okay. <laughs> uh, oh, well. The second reason is that Gormagala is actually a baby. And just like Scourge's super form, Gormagala is actually a baby elder dragon. Shigaru Magala, however, unlike Scourge, it is calm and calculating and set on destroying everything, and it still has the frenzy virus, and it can see and can deliberately spread the virus. It is one of the main villains of the series, making sure everything is dead so the younger Gore Magala doesn't get a, don't get a food source. Your thoughts, P.S.? I got this info from a Rage Gaming video, so shout out to him and his Monster Hunter lore videos, which will help you understand Monster Hunter! I'm not sure I quite followed, but I'm... I, I appreciate your patronage, Chaos Sonic One, but come on, man. Periods, throw some periods <laughs> in here. Some some uh, some punctuation would be nice. Yes, Gormagala is a baby. <laughs> he is baby. What does this have to do with Scourge's super form? These men's is um, babies. There's the Elder Dragon Shigaru Magala. Well, I hope you got and... fired for this blunder, Ian. Oh yeah, I never got work in this department again. <laughs> Uh, Shigaru is set on destroying everything. It also has the frenzy virus, spreads the virus on purpose, and it is purposefully ruining the ecosystem so that the babies can't eat. So Mm -hmm. it's trying to drive itself to extinction. I don't follow. Sounds like it. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Maybe I'm missing something here, but if that's like, if that's, if I'm understanding this correctly, that's stupid. (laughs) Well, you know, it's a video game, Ian. Sometimes they now, granted, do stupid I, things. I, I don't know a ton about Monster Hunter and their lore. I don't know if it's supposed to be kind of a fantasy ecosystem with some semblance of grounding in reality, or if it's pure on fantasy nonsense and, you know, this thing is a Sith Lord. It's evil for the sake of evil. And yar, har, har, I kill my babies. So maybe it's on point and I just not appreciating what's been put before me. I don't know. Hmm. I've been watching this video called The Importance of Devil May Cry 2 from a YouTuber called Medi, not the bad guy. And while it is called the black sheep of the series, Devil May Cry 2 did introduce a lot of elements that basically got the series what it was known for. So that got me wondering, had the Sonic series tried not to pull back the ideas that were implemented in the series and actually improved on them, how different would the Sonic series be? FYI, this was written before Frontiers was made. That is a big question, because it's not just the narrative direction or the lack of cohesion between titles. It's the company perspective and uh, the history of the brand. Yeah. Like, you know, Sonic Heroes was a big departure from anything that had been from SA1 and 2, but that was also when they went multi-platform for the first time. Uh, it was largely in response to the fandom at the time who didn't want these realistic and dark dramatic stories. They wanted something closer to the happy-go-lucky classic stuff, which is why you get a very thin story with lots of brightly colored and fantastic environments. Uh, People really liked having more characters, and so they got more characters. You get four full teams. Um, and I want to say that there was a desire to incorporate more RPG elements into it. And what we got was what was scaled back into the final production. So I don't know part of the underlying philosophy with Sonic's development, from my understanding, is a desire to keep things fresh, to not just pump out the same thing over and over again, versus something like Mario, where the evolution of gameplay from like 64 to odyssey is nominal. Are they polished for their generation? Absolutely. Were they innovative at the time? Sure. Are they fun? Absolutely. But it's in you get down to the core mechanics. It's pretty much the same thing, you know? So Sonic, if you look between SA, even SA one and SA two, you know, SA one is a much more open-ended adventure with mini games, whereas SA1 is a much more focused, almost arcadey feel. 
and then you have heroes which is speedy platforming i guess with light rpg elements and then you've got light gunplay with shadow with the engine of heroes it's weird man (laughs) so you know it would have the whole underlying thought here is that experimental element you know trying to do something new trying to see what works and to not just do the same thing over and over again i know there's folks who are saying i'm so tired of the boost games but unleashed is a completely different beast than colors yeah the the daytime stages cannot be compared to colors in complexity in tone in excitement in anything never mind the story um versus forces versus anything else so god what even was the question again (laughs) (laughs) oh well what if things had been more consistent i i don't know it would be a question of what if the entire design philosophy behind sonic was different for the past 20 something years and that i feel like has a gigantic ripple effect because it would us it would kind of work with the assumption that sa1 and sa2 set the tone that was followed although you might even argue that it would have led us to frontiers coulda yeah um going back to mario um you gotta look at how often mainline mario games are released versus mainline sonic games that too you get like one a console generation with with mario at least since the n64 you you only get one so and with sonic you get like five (laughs) yeah okay not that many this time but we've we've gotten we had forces and now we have frontiers so yeah and, and frontiers is like right on the cusp of between two generations because we're still in a weird transit transitionary period Mm -hmm. so and uh, that's not to say and this is to save off some of the angry comments this isn't to say that mario hasn't had any innovation in between here and now oh obviously 3d mario land is clearly a different style the rpgs are very different from each other um the new super mario brothers are a you know modern twist on the classic formula but that's still building off of you know, the original Mario Brothers style. And it's all of those bells and whistles. All of those are spin-offs technically. They're spin-off series. I'm yeah. talking mainline three D Mario. Like the I think the only ones that really factor in there are the well, not they're not three D the whole time, but you know, going back through Mario One to Mario World. Maybe Yoshi's Island, but that kind of ended up breaking off into its own spin off series itself. So uh and then you got 64, and then Sunshine, the Galaxy Games, 3D Land and World, maybe? I don't know exactly where they factor into the main line. And then you got Odyssey. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a little bit of a mush of games. Like, there's different branches of it. And so Sega doesn't really do that with Sonic. It tries to kind of shoehorn every version of Sonic into the main, <laughs> main line at this point. It didn't used to be that way. Like, advanced games were kind of their own thing for a bit. So, hmm. It's just, you get a lot more Sonic than you do Mario, especially over the last 20 years. So, uh, If if Sonic had taken more of a traditional route like Mario and Zelda and Kirby and found a formula and just stuck with it and made iterations on it over the years, I feel like we probably would have wound up with Frontiers again maybe a little sooner maybe and we might have seen more games like Yoshi's Island where the core mechanic is spun out on another character and changed enough that it becomes its own thing right like maybe Shadow would have been an ongoing spin-off maybe Knuckles would have been an ongoing treasure hunter type game maybe we would have gotten a dedicated uh shooter platformer like Eggman and Tails and Gamma yeah. i don't know it's really hard to say mm. yeah uh, it is hard to say. So, let's stop. Frontiers actually opened the door in a way for the Noctis clan to be canonized in a way. While I know Sega wouldn't allow it, the door is there still once things settle. Don't you agree? Nope, dead forever. Well, sorry, Chaos Sonic 1. I wanted to clarify something else in my November mini. You confuse the alternate timelines thing when you are actually mistaken. Granted, I messed up in that also, as what I mean to say was classic era and modern Sonic 
are both one timeline and in the same dimension again, right? His forces tried to retcon the classic Sonic era into being an alternate dimension, hence one of the reasons why I hated the game. Granted, that game is bland as can be, but that's neither here nor there, and Frontiers fixes the itches I wanted from forces. Yeah, as of now, classic and modern are one timeline, one reality, one continuity. And that seems to have caused a lot of grumblings from people who are now confused about why and how certain events have taken place and the order of them. Well, here we are. It is funny Frontiers was released the day after Forces was released. How does it feel that one of the most enjoyable Sonic games, in my opinion, is next to, and keep in mind, this is my opinion, the most boring game ever. Man, you haven't played a lot of video games if you think Sonic Forces is the most boring video game ever, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) I know it gets a lot of fun. I had fun with it. I certainly see where it could have been more in some ways, but I enjoyed it well enough. I didn't think Forces was that bad. I think the hate on it is overblown, and it'll go back in about 10 years. Come back in about 10 years, and the kids who are now old enough uh, to have played Forces when they were kids will love it. So, you know, it's the new Sonic cycle. (laughs) (laughs) We're currently in the state where Generations is being remembered not fondly and it's like oh ah. colors is being freaking lambasted and i remember when that game came out and people loved it and they were excited about it it's because it's one of the best sonic games yeah yeah Yeah. come at me bro Uh (laughs) uh-huh uh yeah 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 that's just kind of how it goes so also i think if i think uh, frontiers came out at least a few days after forces I think they mean just by date, <laughs> but still, it's kind of yeah, funny but the way this is that, worded. <laughs> the very next day, mean. here's Frontier. <laughs> after forces. No, no. That's kind of meaningless to me. It's, you know, if the sequel game comes out, you know, within a certain window of the game that preceded it, that's just the progression of time. That's just that mar- doesn't really mean anything to me. That's just marketing. That's just everybody releasing their games in October, November, and early December to try and capitalize on the holiday season. That too. It's like, that's pretty much it. I mean, look when Sonic two came out, that was back in November 92. So yeah, it just, that's how it goes. How do you feel about the saying from the great Reggie fils I sent a link to the quote here, but while it is a lead into a commercial for Mario Odyssey, it to me does feel like it has a point in some way that some games have been lacking for the past few years. Games are meant to be challenging and fun. If it is not, then why bother? I I feel like that's a fine general rule of thumb, but it doesn't hold up to any greater scrutiny because fun and challenge are subjective. Right. Well, fun is subjective. Challenge is on a gradient. Like what some people find a walk in the park, others find exceedingly difficult. Um, or tedious and boring. Yeah. Like, case in point, I'm going to out myself here. Um, I recently started getting into Elden Ring. You know, well behind the curve. I know, I know. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel any better, I've never played a Soulsborne game in my life. <laughs> yeah. And I I know as a Soulsborne type game, it is punishing. I went into that knowing full well that it was going to hand me my ass. And I would have to say, thank you, sir. May I have another? I get that. And it is beautiful. Uh, The fantasy setting is remarkable. The exploration I have done is interesting. And uh, the various creatures and uh, areas you come across are sometimes fascinating and beautiful, even though they are horrific. They are at least really interesting. They're not just kind of brain dead oh it's gooey and spooky it's legitimately unnerving and interesting to look at as they stop me in two hits <laughs> um, my lack of progress is purely a lack of skill on my end that i'm not trying to weasel out of but the punishing it, that level of punishment i don't find particularly fun i get where some people come from and that kind of brutal challenge that unforgiving lack of hand holding. I understand the appeal. I do too, yeah. 
it's just it's more frustrating to me because I don't have a chance to learn or uh, scramble and try to come back at it. It's, oh, you're dead. Try again. And it's the aggressiveness of the world that I find the most off-putting. There's no, there's very few instances where you can just stop and drink in the terrain. Like there was one instance where I'm going through the woods and there's some kind of cadaver in a chair just in the middle of a clearing that had a pickup on it. And so I stopped. I'm like, is this an important thing? Is this interesting? Is there something I should be looking around? Is this a point of interest? And then a 20 foot bear came out of nowhere and just slapped my shit in. So that kind of took the wind out of my sails. Like, oh, so I'm not supposed to stop. I'm not supposed to look around the terrain or explore. I need to keep moving and always be on my toes, always be ready to fight to the death at any given moment. And that, I don't need that tension in my life, man. <laughs> but Elden Ring is rather, rather universally agreed upon as an incredibly fun, incredibly challenging game. Right. Does that mean I'm wrong? No, that's my personal perception. Does that mean everyone else is wrong? No, of course not. The general consensus is this is one of the best games to ever be. And I acknowledge that. So while what Reggie says is fundamentally true, that something should be fun and it should be engaging. I think that's a better word than challenging. What is fun and what is acceptably challenging is going to vary from person to person. And I feel like that should be taken into account to the other extreme. Not everything has to be for everybody. You know, mm-hmm. I might still pick at Elden Ring every now and again when I feel like I haven't been hurt recently, <laughs> but I acknowledge this ain't my bag. This is not something that I can necessarily do. Um, you know, any of the horror games, survival horror stuff. I, I don't like that stuff. I do not engage. That is not fun for me. That does not mean Resident Evil 4 should have a non-scary unlimited ammo version just for me. I, I can sit out on that one. That game is for that crowd and they can enjoy it and they can have fun and hopefully it's engaging for them. All righty. At the time, this question is written, Sonic Speed Simulator just put the Kunoich Amy, and while it is not canon, as you said yourself many times, it is mentioned, this does get me thinking, what if instead of going to Knothole in pre-Super Genesis wave of Archie, what if Amy went to the Dragon Kingdom as when was raised by any of the four clans? How would each of the clans raise her, and how would she be? This is number one, assuming that any of them would actually take her in, because they were very isolationist in their own rights, but we'll ignore that for the sake of the question. Mm-hmm. Um, if she were to go into, let's say she got picked up by the Yagyu, uh, became like the right hand to the Bride of Rich Knights. Uh, number one, Iron King wouldn't have off to the Bride, that's for sure. And I don't know, I could see her kind of becoming their greatest muscle in the group, like the living embodiment of smash and grab. This is assuming that the hammer comes with her, that it's like a mystically tied item. And uh, because I think that's how we were going in pre-reboot, if I remember correctly. So, you know, the Yagyu thieves are out there pillaging the land. And if anybody tries to actually stop them, she comes in and stops them. Uh, Raiju clan, well, they're already warlike. So now you've got Amy with potentially lightning channeled hammer (laughs) in addition to everything else. That sounds awesome. Now, maybe her inherent compassion means that she doesn't finish off her opponent. She's just content with defeating them, but she is schooled in the ways of making lots of pain, lots of really darn fast. <laughs> uh, the Cosmer clan. That's almost like saying Amy becomes a nun, <laughs> you know, or, or she goes out into the world following the web of fate to ensure things play out a certain way and maybe her fortune cards are a way of interpreting that or there's a different version of them something that's more tied to the web of fate maybe instead of fortune cards she does like uh how was it called when you do like the strings between your fingers to make like cat's cradle and stuff like very quick weavings to fortune tell that might be kind of a fun twist on things uh and then for the shinobi clan that would be worth it just for the long con 
she's there in the narrative as she always was. You don't think it's any different. You think this is just standard Amy, but surprise she's been constant vigil sleeper agent and the freedom fighters this whole time. <laughs> oh, no. fan growing over that fan growing over Sonic. That was just to keep tabs on him. Why is she paying so much attention to Sonic? Oh, she's a fan girl. I don't worry about it. No ninja spy. <laughs> wow. You've explained everything Ian. perfect. You've solved it. You've figured it out, Ian. You've justified it. We've you've done it. Man, we, we this show is so productive. <laughs> <laughs> While you say that exploring about Amy's over-obsession at this time is bad, I both half agree and disagree. At this time, yes, I agree that it's too soon for us to have that relationship explored as one Sega probably still has that rule about shipping at this time. The other half is all of that character study and her exploring her relationship with Sonic after her self-discovery, we can explore what it means for the Son Amy once Sega definitely allows pairings to be a thing. That is, whether or not this ship can sink or swim. See what the flaws were, how they can be improved, and make it a character study of these two, and when the time is right, as I'm a sucker for that, as with Dark Mirrors, and no, this is not a fan idea, sorry. If I'm overthinking on it, just after you talked about the elephant in the room that is Tales of Development and Unleashed in Forces and in Frontiers, it basically got me thinking of how other Sonic characters that do need this with their elephants cough, shadow cough. You both got what I mean, right? I'm not 100% sure I did, actually. Um, there wasn't, there was like one comma in this entire question. Uh, two commas. There we go. There's two commas there. And no I've... periods. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Chaos Sonic 1. I'm going to harp on this, but it's really difficult to read your questions. <laughs> I think I got the crux of this after a couple reads and as it stands, I don't feel like we can properly address it. So rather than do something, do a half measure or do something that isn't, you know, totally satisfactory, I would rather wait until it is possible to do it. Or if time has passed and she has found herself to such a degree that it would be more harmful to dredge up an old plot point or characterization just to reconcile it with the present one. It may be better just to say, okay, this is who she is now and we're moving forward, but that's hard to say at this point. Yeah. Kunuich Amy is training under SBO, but I saw SBO symbol, which is this and the other is SBO's clan in pre reboot Archie. And he provides two links to images that seemed very similar. Now, I know you have no connection to Sonic Speed Sim, and Sonic Speed Sim is not canon, as you stated multiple times, but it is awfully coincidental to the pre-Super Genesis Shinobi clan, especially since SBO symbol is almost the same as pre-reboot Archie. I mean, Sega has to have at least some say in Speed Sim. Care to ask them about it, or rather not risk them getting in trouble? And if allowed, could this open the doors for some elements from pre-reboot Archie to be allowed, as long as it doesn't step on certain anyone's toes? I'm... Not going to comment on any similarities or lack thereof. I think it's better that I just not weigh in on this one. Yep. I didn't see it. I didn't notice. Did you notice? I didn't see anything. And our last question. My take on Scourge Frontier's question that Scourge Time has asked. Keep the Coco and the end as the same, but instead of Onox, Rosie, and Miles, how about Scourge gets there and it's Fiona, Dr. Finitivus, and one of the Destructix? How would the character development go here for Fiona, Dr. Finitivus, and your choice of destructive, destructive member and Scourge? Well, with Fiona, he would actually try to get her out. Um, he actually would want her around, I would imagine, and then be really annoyed that it didn't work the first time. You know, what do you mean? I got to go fight more stinking robots. And then he'd start wondering if it was really worth the effort. Uh, <laughs> Starline, he'd laugh in his face and leave him there. And any of the Destructix, uh, given how we saw him last, I think he would make an effort to break them out because he wants his hired muscle back. Did, he did, wants wait, his on. gang. Did you mean, did you mean Finitivus and said Starline? <laughs> That's a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no similarities at all between these two characters. No. <laughs> Boy, this ties into the last question. <laughs> Pick up in three, <laughs> two, one. <laughs> he finds Dr. Finitivus and just laughs at him, leaves him there as he is. And then with any of the Destructix, he's just going to want his gang back because it's his gang. How dare you deny him his muscle? doesn't really matter who's in the cage. He's going to make an effort to get them out, not necessarily be reassuring about it, 
And he's going to make a point of how he's totally rescuing them and they totally owe him when this is over and they got to do whatever he says, but it's not really out of any kind of generosity or camaraderie on his part. Mm, mm. I think I would prefer Surge Frontiers instead of Scourge Frontiers personally, but mm. that's just me. <laughs> uh, I, I think you have fun with that. All right. We're at the end of this mini. Yep. Thank you to Chaos Sonic 1 for sponsoring this Bumblecast Mini. If you want one of your own, head over to patreon.com slash bumblecast, ko-fi.com slash bumblecast, or become a YouTube member. See you in the next one. Oh, 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 oh,